My name is Amy Liu, and I'm a vice president here at the Brookings Institution and director of the Metropolitan Policy Program. You know, our program here at Brookings and the National League of Cities have the honor of bringing together a distinguished group of leaders who have traveled from very far to join us to discuss a critical issue, the importance of inclusive growth. In the U.S., the U.S. economy is expanding, but we know that the gains are not benefiting many members of our society. And you see this challenge not only at the national level in the United States, but locally as well. Recently, we produced a Metro Monitor, and in that report, uh, Brookings uh, looked at the health and performance of our nation's largest city regions in the United States since the recession. We found that nearly all of the largest metro areas have experienced improvements in jobs, in output, mirroring the broader growth in the economy. But of the 100 largest metro areas, only eight have made progress in inclusion in terms of improving, um, making progress on employment, on income, um, in our population, including by race. In short, what those findings tell me is that economic growth is easy, but inclusion is much harder. And that is why we need to be much more intentional about how we extend the benefits of growth and engage more people in our prosperity. And that is the topic we are going to talk about today. Now, Despite these challenges, however, cities remain essential to achieving what we at Brookings call an advanced economy that works for all. Cities matter because they are the hubs of innovation, commerce, and critical infrastructure, and they are the places where people from across diverse backgrounds go to seek jobs and opportunity. In an, in an era of political gridlock at the national level, we have found that city leaders have also become the source of optimism and pragmatic problem solving, working across all sectors to position their communities for broad-based prosperity. Now, we're not alone in this belief. We're tremendously excited that in March of this past year, the OECD, in partnership with the Ford Foundation, which is also a generous supporter of this program at Brookings, launched an inclusive growth in cities campaign. Anchored by a network of champion mayors from across the globe, the campaign intends to raise awareness of rising inequality across our cities and developing concrete solutions where the majority of global citizens live today, our urban centers. Now behind this effort is the energetic, passionate and dynamic Secretary General of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Angel Gurria. The Secretary General will discuss in a moment a new economic report and the rationale for an inclusive growth in cities campaign. And no doubt, with the tragic events this week in Orlando, he will also stress why inclusive growth and social cohesion is even more important today. Now, before we start the program, let me just talk a little bit about the logistics and the flow for today. Uh, after Secretary General speaks, and he will take a few minutes of questions, so be prepared for things you might want to ask, uh, he, we will then move to a panel discussion with Q&A that will feature public, private, and civic leaders from cities and metropolitan areas in the United States who are going to share their lessons on what they are doing to tackle this problem and opportunity around inclusive growth. Now, those watching today's event on webcast also have an opportunity to join in our Q&A today. You can ta uh, tweet your questions through the Twitter using the hashtag inclusive cities, and my colleague Allison will be monitoring the Twitter feed throughout the event and look for questions that we can pose. Now, I am pleased to introduce OECD Secretary General Angel Gurria. Now, Secretary Gurria has had an impressive career. 
Now, during his tenure at OECD, the organization has expanded its membership and strengthened its role as a hub for global dialogue and debate around membership and strengthened its role yeah, and, um, around global dialogue and debate around economic policy. Now, previously, Secretary General Gurria served as Mexico's Minister of Foreign Affairs, during which time he played a key role in negotiations for NAFTA. And as some of you may know, Secretary General tends to enjoy sharing his work with global leaders. And we are major consumers of the great research that comes out of the OECD. So it's my turn to return the favor. <laughs> Given your leadership in NAFTA, I wanted to show you, share with you our report, Metro North America, which shows how important our US, Canada, and Mexico metro areas are part of the integrated fabric of production in the world economy. And I wanted to share with you Remaking Economic Development, which is a paper that I authored, which I think of as a playbook for cities on how they can create an economy that can create generous, ge continuous growth and inclusion for our citizens. So I'm going to hand these to you. you. <laughs> and I have to say, I've gotten to know um, the Secretary General over the last couple visits, and I just am really impressed by his commitment to this issue. So on behalf of Brookings and the National League of Cities, please join me in welcoming Secretary Gurria. Thank you, Amy, and um, thank you to uh, Brookings for the invitation and to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, this afternoon, uh, actually a little later, uh, we will be launching the 2016 Economic Survey of the United States. You shouldn't uh, see it because it's under embargo officially, but uh, don't tell anybody. Um, and with it, we are going to be uh, uh, presenting this uh, brochure called Improving Opportunities for Women in the United States. It's a sort of a, an amuse-bouche that we're adding to the, to the, we're very French, you know, so, so that, that we're adding to the, uh, to the economic survey of the United States. And um, basically, um, I think I, I should start with this because it, it's good news, mostly. Um, seven years after the depths of the financial crisis, the U.S., is making a comeback, registering one of the strongest economic recoveries in the OECD. Our survey charts um, increased output, reduced unemployment, improved fiscal sustainability. Certain regions and sectors in particular have experienced stronger growth, California and the Northeast Corridor, for example. However, the revival in economic fortunes has not prevailed evenly across the country or across different parts of the population. Just over a year ago, uh, when I was uh, here last, I spoke to you about the state of inequalities in the United States and across the OECD. Now, sadly, despite the US's steady recovery, the trends in income inequality have continued to worsen even after the crisis. Now, we say even after the crisis, unfortunately, we are still living the consequences of the crisis. We, the legacies are very heavy, a slow growth and uh, high unemployment and growing inequalities and, and a very precipitous drop in um, confidence and trust. Uh, those are still not even scars, they're still open wounds from the, from the crisis. And the question of inequality uh, has uh, continued. Now, let me tell you to what extent. The average income of the top 10% um, in the case of the United States was 19 times higher than that of the bottom 10%. Say, so what? Well, it's compared to 10 times, 9.6 times less actually, in the OECD on average. So you're talking about the U.S. now being about double the average of the OECD. Hmm? Now, um, and this is, how is it in terms of um, evolution? Well, the average 
ten times was seven times only a generation ago. And in the U.S., it's been going from 12 to 15 to, no, close to 18, 19. So clearly very, very fast and clearly in the wrong direction. Large segments of the population continue to face significant obstacles in the labor market and aren't sharing in the gains of a strengthening U.S. economy. The share of women in the labor force has continued to decline, <clears throat> reaching levels below Germany and Japan. And a considerable wage gap persists, with women earning around 18% less than men, something which is almost now a cliché. Minority groups also earn less and have lower rates of labor market participation. In particular, African Americans and Hispanic men earn slightly less than three quarters the income of white men, a gap that has hardly budged in over a decade. This is the other problem, that you see the problem and you measured it you know, 10 years ago, and then you, see it, you measure it today, and it doesn't seem to be, you know, it's like Johnny Walker, it just keeps on you know, so comfortably. <laughs> It's a, so uh, uh, it, it's, it's, we're not kind of m making any progress on, on such sensitive issues. Now, employment rates have also fallen among people with disabilities. The number of people receiving disability benefits now is larger than those receiving unemployment benefits. Now, this has two reasons. One of them is that you've created 16 million jobs in the last five years, so you're kind of a, uh, bringing down the unemployment rate, but also that the disability um, list is growing so fast. Clearly, the U.S. can and must do better to ensure the gains from the stronger economy uh, are shared by all. Now, a more inclusive economy, a more inclusive labor market are also key to boosting growth and productivity. We now have mounting evidence that rising inequalities harm growth because up to the poorest 40% of the population find it too onerous to invest in their own skills and education. They're paying for their livelihoods, but they can't afford the luxury of investing in their own futures because they're spending all their income, you know, paying for their present. Um, so you have a deterioration of their outlook. Now, fighting inequality is not only a global and national concern, it's also very local. We've been reminded in recent months just how small and connected our troubled world has become. The refugee crisis, climate change, international terrorism, the heavy legacy of the economic crisis on growth and jobs and rising inequality. And then the, what you call the systemic worldwide issues that connect with local issues. Um, the best example, the tragedy in Orlando. Um, now, but even as the effects of globalization spread, its impacts are always bound to play out locally. Our work on inequalities has shown that the gap between the rich and the poor is higher, often rising faster in larger cities, including in the wealthiest, primarily due to skills distribution and to the capturing of the top earners. In those cities, rich and poor people often live segregated in different neighborhoods. A forthcoming OECD report called Making Inclusive Growth Happen in Cities, suggests that the most income-segregated cities in the Netherlands and France are more or less at comparable levels to the least segregated cities in the United States. Now, we, we know traditionally that in European um, societies, the level of equality is higher, the level of inequality is lower. But uh, when you look at the cities, the highest uh, are equivalent to the least uh, segregated here. So it shows, again, that there's a lot of, um, of distance to, um, to go here in the U.S. Inequality is not just about money, by the way. 
It is also felt in labor market exclusion, lower social mobility, greater polarization in educational and health outcomes. And here too, we have reason to be worried about the state of our cities. Today in Brussels, I was going to say we are launching, but actually because of time difference, we have launched <laughs> um, our Regions at a Glance publication. Um, this report, this is a yearly publication. Um, the report shows that when income, jobs, and health outcomes are considered together, disparities across cities and regions are consistently starker than those in income only. So uh, you're talking income, jobs, and health together rather than only income. For instance, recent findings in Baltimore suggest that life expectancy can differ by double-digit numbers across neighborhoods in a single city. Forget about, you know, we're not talking about cr across countries, we're not talking about uh, states in the United States, we're talking about neighborhoods in a single city. Uh, take the case of education, where the OECD review of the Chicago region, we did Chicago land, not just the legal perimeter of Chicago, but the 21 counties, three states. Um, we report that high school uh, graduation rates range from 57% in the city itself, the inner city, to over 95% in some of the wealthier, mm, better off suburban areas. So you're talking almost double and just a few miles away. Hmm? These inequalities not only take an economic toll, they also come at great humanitarian costs. These are lives cut short. These are children stopped in their tracks from fulfilling their full potential. Now, the good news is that good policies can make a big difference. We can make a difference. And no one knows this better than mayors. Um, we have the chief executive here of King County today. We're honored to have you here, sir. By the way, he just became a champion mayor um, for inclusive growth. Um, Subnational governments control many policy levers for promoting prosperity, well-being, and inclusive growth. They carry around 40% of the total public spending in the OECD and 60% of public spending. So you're talking about the majority of the money that is spent, at least by in the public, um, the public uh, accounts, is spent at the local level. This is precisely why, just a few months ago in New York, as uh, Amy uh, informed, with Mayor Bill de Blasio and 20 other mayors from around the world, in collaboration with the Ford Foundation, we launched the Inclusive Growth in Cities campaign, and um, Lamia is signaling, and she'll wring my neck if I don't do this, you know, which is a, no, but this is, these are the proceedings from the launch of the Inclusive Growth in Cities campaign, which actually produced the um, New York proposal for inclusive growth in cities. We now have about 50 um, champion mayors from New York to Paris, Minneapolis to Medellin, Atlanta to Cape Town, and beyond. And uh, by the way, on the 21st of November, better start packing, um, uh, we'll have a meeting of all the champion mayors in um, Paris, um, uh, hosted by Mayor uh, Anne Hidalgo. Now, um, champion mayors have signed on to this New York proposal for inclusive growth in cities, setting out a common commitment to a policy agenda that aims to ensure that cities work for all. And this means providing education and training systems. This is a question of enabling people of all ages to develop skills and improve their life chances. Skills are the new currency. You know, when uh, some of us studied uh, business in our young age, um, the teachers would kind of um, try to play games with us and say, what's the success of business? And, we all try to say things and then say, location, 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 you know? Um, now location, of course, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, 
But uh, now they say education, education. Well, now it's skills, 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 which is a combination of education with innovation, with lifelong learning, with vocational training, etc. Uh, that is a new, the new currency of productivity and competitiveness and, and progress. Uh, for instance, for new immigrants, cities can build bridges to employment, support recognition of skills gained overseas, provide training to adapt existing skills to new contexts. Let me just um, mention one program in New York City which offers free courses to help small business owners launch and expand operations. And they do it in English, Spanish, Russian, and Mandarin. So it's a, an interesting uh, example. Promoting labor markets that make the most of women, youth, those with disabilities, and foreign-born populations is a very important other pillar. It includes family-friendly policies that make it easier for women to remain in the workforce. The latest U.S. economic survey reports that states that have implemented such policies are recording higher levels of women in the workforce, including in management positions. Are investing in high-quality and universally accessible infrastructure and public services, again, another important pillar. This can open up new employment and training opportunities for the most disadvantaged, promoting both growth and equity objectives. And it means changing the way in which we build and in which we move around our cities. Mayors tell us that affordable housing is one of the biggest challenges uh, that they, they face in the city. And the topic remains at the top of the global urban agenda. But too often, housing policies are divorced from a broader strategy for urban development or transport and access to services. So we need housing policies that aim to build cities rather than building houses. We have very, very bad examples of cases one of them in my own country, in the urban um, metropolitan area of Mexico City, but also throughout the country where they started to build houses and houses and houses and houses because they, they have this, this fixed income revenue that they felt they had to spend, so they build a lot of houses. And the houses are disconnected from the cities. There's no, com there's no transport, there's no communications, there's not even appropriate services because the municipalities don't grow up as fast as the needs, and therefore, what you have is totally total disconnection. What you have is hundreds of thousands of empty houses in countries which have housing shortages, which is obviously a tragedy. It's an economic tragedy and a human tragedy. Now, I'd like to praise the joint efforts of the Department of Housing and Urban Development here in the US, the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, in creating the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. It aims to promote integrated urban planning to help local authorities meet housing, transport, and environmental objectives together. And that is the most important concept. So what next? Over the coming months, we will work with our coalition of champion mayors to elevate their voices, their visions, their ambitions on the global stage. Their efforts and insights must inform national priorities and advance global agendas. We will continue to refine measurement tools, identify policies at work, and help governments in the implementation process. We like to say that it's about implementation, 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 but not necessarily in that order. Uh, and, and remember, we have our work cut out. Um, we now have the Sustainable Development Goals, and now we have the COP21, and now we even have our targets uh, on taxes uh, at the OECD. We got all that cleared and approved in 2015, and now it's about implementation. Now, we'll also develop a platform to enable cities to exchange best practices in the policy domains that matter for inclusive growth. I mentioned that uh, Mayor Anne Hidalgo of Paris will host the second meeting of the champion mayors in Paris, building on the New York proposal. And of course, uh, we're working already on the Paris uh, action plan so that um, 
it focuses again on implementation. Now, we know we can't go at it alone. This campaign aims to bring key stakeholders around the table, Brookings very, very importantly, and serve as a global platform for the debate on inequalities. We're working hand in hand while at supporting institutions, the National League of Cities, the Cities Alliance, the C40, which is a, um, we've been working with the C40 for many, many years now, uh, the, the largest uh, 40 cities, uh, ICLE, United Cities and Local Governments, United Way Worldwide, uh, to try to make the aspirations of inclusive cities worldwide a reality. We're delighted that the mayors of Atlanta, Birmingham, Los Angeles, Portland, New York, Santa Fe, Santa Monica, and King County are among the first U.S. cities to have joined the campaign. And we hope many others will follow. So, dear friends, the OECD's mission is to promote better policies for better lives. This is how we define our aspiration and our mission and our vision. So if we want economies and societies in which everyone has a shot of success, we must ensure that cities are at the heart of that fight. Thank you. Yeah. Couple of questions, I'm told. Questions or comments or violent objections? Uh... Yes, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the, the gap between the, the top 10% and bottom 10%, but the inequalities between the top 1% and the 10% or between the one-tenth of 1% and the top 1%, those at the top, those inequalities are much greater, and these are people that basically have the same set of skills. Uh, so there's something in addition to skills that accounts for the surging inequality of the last 30 years, and I was wondering if you could address that at, at all. Finance. Finance. Um, it's the, what you're talking about, the 1%, then what you're talking about, 0.1%. I mean, um, the, the financial sector um, grew a lot. People were attracted to the financial sector. The best and the brightest would come out of our universities and be recruited by, very aggressively, by the way, by the, um, normally it was consulting firms, lawyers, and banks. Um, so, but um, uh, the banks took a, a very important place. Uh, and uh, the remuneration patterns are somewhat different. Um, in the, what, what makes it different is that, say, in the industrial world, the manufacturing world, the commercial world, the chief executives can make a lot of money because of their options and whatever you want, stock options. And, um, but the, the number of people in the financial sector that can make a lot of money, and because of the huge amounts involved, this is universal banks, you know, that work all over the world, et cetera. Um, is, is, has been traditionally very large. And if anything, it has um, accelerated um, given uh, the specialization and given... So, so uh, I think that explains a, a lot of this uh, polarization. The second is that um, look at what has happened to interest rates. Uh, if you have savings, your interest rates will um, tend to have your savings, you know, uh, produce less uh, in the relatively, uh, well, in the, le in the least risky types of investments. Um, whereas um, the people who are, uh, you know, running these large corporations or who are running um, the financial world, et cetera, tend to um, have, um, be better informed, uh, make better in, in you know, personal investment decisions. Um, so that's, that's another question. It's about information, but also it's about, uh, let's say, the shrewdness of the individuals. And, and last but not least, uh, it has to do with the tax system. Uh, the tax system in our societies, in many cases, is not progressive enough. Um, 
and uh, it's capped in many cases. Uh, the top rates are capped. Um, in fact, let me just tell you uh, to finish um, that you used to have, and this was, we used to do this for Latin America because um, you, let's say that everybody was at 50% Gini, you know, 50 points Gini. Uh, everybody was just as unequal uh, in the beginning. But then you applied to taxes and you applied the social security contributions and you got, you know, what you got back for that. And basically, the reduction of the, um, in Europe, let's say, redu reduced by 40%. Uh, in the United States, it used to be at least a third. And in Latin America, it didn't move an inch. Which is, because people don't pay taxes. Hmm? Uh, and, uh, well, that's, that's a good reason. Hmm? Uh, but also because um, there's a kind of a, a very large informal um, labor market. So you, you, when you look at the contributions to the Social Security, et cetera, they don't make that much of a difference. So, but um, what has happened? In the United States, we're losing this. Less and less, the tax system is a great equalizer. Um, that's important, and we should review. Well, I mean, there are many reasons why you should review the tax, the tax system in the United States. Uh, but this is one of them. Uh, it's kind of losing its its teeth in terms of as an equalizer. So, uh, sorry for the very long answer. But, and the reason why we say 10% is because the 1% has these explanations. It's almost a cliche now, but also because it does not, let's say, does not give us any large numbers in terms of the implications. Yes, it gives us very brutal differences, uh, but, but the problem is not with, let's say, is not in the 1% up or down, it's basically in much larger numbers. As I said, up to 40% of the workforce may be threatened by technology or, or by the lack of skills. Um, so we're talking very massive numbers. Um, and that's why we say the 10%, the 10% as a, as a measure. Um, and also because it helps us to compare better because the phenomenon of um, of the 1% is also quite peculiar to the US. It's less, let's say, it's also peculiar to countries where they have big financial centers, uh, like the UK and others, but, um, but it's uh, more peculiar to the US, whether the 10%, 10% is more useful to compare more of the societies. Yeah, sorry. One more? Yes, ma'am. Don't believe anything they say. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I am going to address this when we present the economic survey of the United States today, but let me give you um, a bit of an advance here. Um, it's been eight years into the crisis, and in these eight years, we've been striving to consolidate the fiscal accounts, to bring down the deficits, which the United States has done very well, by the way. And the United States did it right because they did the heavy lifting first. They kind of front-loaded the fiscal effort. So they were slashing 1.5% per year. So no, they're working at about half a percent per year, which is fine. It's, it's very sustainable without sacrificing growth. And it's a bad international scenario, so it's appropriate that the U.S. doesn't have to be putting the brakes on for fiscal reasons, but you're absolutely right. What were the things that were wrong and why did we have to go for fiscal consolidation and also for a great refurbishing of the banking sector um, capital, um, regulations, supervision, 
etc., a number of laws, and sometimes even over-regulation, because, you know, you had a very lax, what was perceived to be a very lax regulation, and then it, went, it became kind of pendular, um, and now we're a little worried that um, the banks are not um, uh, lending enough, uh, sometimes um, at least partially uh, because of the regulation. But um, so we are in a much better position today. We are more stable, more solid. Um, we are less vulnerable. And what we're saying is, let's imagine that everybody, when I mean everybody, I mean like the G20, for example. Let's take the G7. Okay. Whatever the baseline is, add one half of 1% of GDP only for infrastructure projects that are of um, high multiplier effect, meaning you spend one, you get two, you know, in exchange. Or, and that paradoxically, because they would break bottlenecks and be, make the economy more, more productive, more efficient, would, after two years or so, bring down the debt to GDP because the GDP would grow. One of the greatest tragedies where we're only talking about measuring GDP, debt to GDP, is that the GDPs have been shrinking. So even if the debt stays the same, the ratios continue to rise. Um, in Japan, for example, you have 230% debt to GDP, and in Greece, you're almost 170 to 180%. Um, and because in, in Italy, even if the debt doesn't rise, the denominator, which is the GDP, have shrunk. Now, for the first time, they stabilized. But the question is, how can you make the GDP grow? Well, you can do it in a controlled environment. We're not, we're not talking about going you know, ballistic. We didn't turn from being you know, uh, totally uh, austerity biased towards being Keynesian from one day to the next. It's that today we can do it in a controlled way and you can plot the path. You say, okay, you deviate somewhat, but you apply it to these infrastructure projects or to creating the human resources, to the skills, etc. And then that will itself accelerate growth and that will then itself um, bring down the debt to GDP and you will have growth and jobs in the meantime. Among other things, why? Because what we have today is not working. It's mediocre, it's undesirable, it's flat. And the problem is, it looks like it's going to stay like that if we don't have a departure. So who can do it? Basically, what we're saying is everybody can if you do this, because if half a percent is going to give you X growth, half a percent by everybody is going to give you X growth by plus maybe a quarter percent, a quarter percentage growth more. So. Uh, again, there's a mutually reinforcing underlying um, strength here. And last but not least, because um, there's a beggar thy neighbor issue. Now, the problem is you, you're very far away from having a, um, you're very far away from having a consensus. Um, you have people like Canada, which are practicing exactly what I'm telling you now. In their last budget, they said, okay, will take, you know, two years longer to get to the balance, et cetera, but they only have 30% debt to GDP. The average of the OECD is 100. Now, but uh, what did the Germans do? Well, when they said they're going to spend 10 billion in the refugees, I said, oh my God, yes, you know, uh, now they're going to be spending more and there's going to be a kind of some balancing here during Europe, you know, the Germans are going to be spending more, they're going to be buying things from the other guys, Lo and behold, they present their budget, and it's a balanced budget, including the 10 billion. Huh? You can never trust these guys. You know, they're, they're so virtuous. No, no, they have a constitutional constraint and a fiscal, you know, a, a fiscal authority, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're bound by it. But what I'm saying is there is this, not everybody's convinced that this is the way out, but what we believe and now the, the IMF has joined us, and, so, and as I said, Canada is going to be a very interesting uh, real-time, uh, real-case laboratory um, about this theory, precisely for the reasons 
that you have mentioned. We think it's high time, after eight years of tightening our belt, to try a different kind of mix in a controlled environment. As I said, we're not going, we're not going ballistic. We're just trying a better, what we believe is a better mix. Thank you all.